thanks everybody for for joining the session uh my name is johnny winter and i'm here to talk to you about gathering data modeling requirements for the lake house uh, with a convenient subtitle how you can collaboratively design a star schema with your business users so good old about me to kick you off um so currently i work for a company called advancing analytics um if you're not familiar with us we're a consultancy that specialize in data engineering and data science. Um, we provide uh, an advisory service so we can come in and do a review of architecture. We do um, implementation so we can be an implementation partner and build a, a data platform for you. And we have uh, education services as well. So we'll provide training. Uh, we've also recently launched uh, an online training platform. I recently joined as an analytics specialist, so I've never really called myself a data engineer. Um, but I'm there to sort of try and grow our analytics practice to sit alongside that already established uh, data engineering and data science practices. Uh, in my spare time, I run the website Grayscale Analytics. Um, that's kind of my online data persona, if you've seen uh, Grayscale Analytics knocking about. Uh, that is just a website. I don't sell any services on it. Um, if you visit gracefulanalytics.com, you can find my blog and links to my YouTube videos. Uh, it's where I go and nerd out about Power BI, which is my favourite part of working with the data platform. Uh, and I'm also a co-organiser of the Manchester Power BI user group as well. So I've worked as a data professional for over 15 years, and that's very much been an accidental career. So I, I don't actually come from a technical background. I dropped out of university. Found myself working an admin job in a finance office where I learned to use Microsoft Excel and it just snowballed from there really. So my early experience was as a BI developer doing crystal reports. If anyone's familiar with uh, crystal reports, uh, I moved on to working with Microsoft technologies. So got into using SQL Server reporting services. Then I started to get more involved in backend development. So uh, learned to do um, Data warehousing using SQL Server, uh, using SSIS, uh, using analysis services to create a self-service layer. And then in more recent years, that's included moving to more cloud-based technologies. So using a lot of Azure products, uh, things like Data Factory, some, um, some Synapse and some Databricks as well. So that 15-year data career has taken me via these destinations, just to give you an idea. So it's been across various industries. Um, my first taste of BI work was working for BA Systems, or a big global company in the defence industry. Um, if you're watching from the UK, you may well be familiar with AO.com. They're the second biggest electricals online retailer, so I did a good stint there helping implement um, their first cloud reporting platform. And then my last few years have all been uh, working in consultancy, so the three companies across the bottom there, Watson's Avenard and now Advancing Analytics, are in consultancy roles, um, where a large emphasis for me has been on doing lake house implementations. So enough about me talking about myself. Why are we here? Why should you be interested in listening to this talk today? So the premise of all the talk in terms of um, modeling data for a lake house is that we should still be applying a data model and that the modeling method we recommend at Advancing Analytics is a star schema. Now, when it comes to designing a star schema, we can face a bit of a problem because there can be a, a disconnect between the development team who are going to be responsible for building the data model in a lake house, and then the business users and analysts who are actually going to use the data platform for, for doing their analysis. So I've worked with some really great developers throughout my career. They you know, really knew how to write um, great optimized SQL. Um, they might know how to effectively structure a data lake um, and make sure that's really, really performant because we know how to apply Z ordering, you know, all these really, really great technical skills. But sometimes they lack business domain knowledge in terms of whatever industry they're working in. Great in terms of technical implementation, but not necessarily as familiar with the day to day running of a business and, and you know, what information needs a business might have. The flip side of that is I've worked with some fantastic business users at the coal face. Um, you know, working day to day, um, delivering products and services for companies, um, potentially running analysis and making those uh, data informed decisions that drive a business forward. And they know what they want from a data platform, 
they're not necessarily great at communicating that to a development team to make sure that the development team can go away and implement that effectively. Now, that can lead to friction between those two parties, potentially um, you know, a lot of tension. Um, it could ultimately lead to a poorly implemented data model. Um, frustrated business users, that might mean lots of turn and forth, lots of rework, having to go back, um, redo parts of the implementation to make sure you can meet those business users' needs. All that rework can be costly, both in terms of money and time. The worst case scenario is that those analysts or business users just don't bother using the data platform because it's not answering the questions they need. They decide to just fill their data needs somewhere else. So rather than using this wonderful data platform, you invested a lot of time and money in implementing, they're just going to stick to downloading a CSV directly from their ERP and shuffling some numbers around in Excel. That's what we want to avoid. So what I'm here today to hopefully do is um, introduce you to a method that's going to help you create a well-designed star schema that's going to be easy for developers to interpret and be able to implement, but also delivers the functionality that makes your business users happy so that they get what they want and they get the full benefit from the data platform. And I want to turn you into a data modeling superhero. So for a bit of context, I guess I want to talk about whether or not is star schema still even relevant because if you look through the internet, lots of people don't think it is. Uh, there's an example of uh, an article on LinkedIn by this chap, Stephen Moody, titled Death Star Schema because he don't think, doesn't think they're needed anymore. This comes from a data expert blog. Apparently in Silicon Valley, dimensional data modeling is dead. We don't need it. Uh, this lady, Claudia Imhoff, seems Claudia to pop up all, all over the place. She seems to have a real vendetta um, against uh, Star Schema, and she's done lots and lots of talks about the fact that we don't need it anymore. I'm a data modeling enthusiast, so I'm going to tell you, that, yes, we do still need it. But should you just listen to me, or should you perhaps um, ask other people um, in the industry? Has somebody got speakers on? Because I'm getting an echo through my headset. Yeah, really I'm sorry. Nice no. Cool. Nice one. Thank you. Um, right. So, yeah, don't just take my word for it listen to some guys in the industry. For example, this guy, if you don't know him, this is Simon Whiteley. He's the founder and director at Advancing Analytics. He's a Microsoft MVP. He's a Databricks beacon. I would say he's one of the pioneers of data lake house implementations. And absolutely, when it comes to implementing the lake house, he advocates for using a star schema. Now you might think I'm biased, and I'm waxing lyrical about this because I work for Simon, I work for Advancing Analytics. There's kind of getting the cause and effect a little bit the wrong way around there, to be honest, because before I worked for Advancing Analytics and I was doing my first lake house implementations working for other consultancies, it was Simon's blogs and conference talks and YouTube videos that I was going to for advice. So I'm not waxing lyrical about him because I work for Advancing Analytics. I went to work for Advancing Analytics because I, I really saw these guys as being, you know, guys leading the way in the lake house space. As well as Simon, um, this is a blog that Databricks uh, published at the end of last year. So I realize a lot of the theme around today's conference is more um, Synapse based, but definitely Databricks probably led the way in terms of um, lake house architecture, in terms of uh, the technology to facilitate that. Again, they advocate that star schema and dimensional modeling is still absolutely relevant in a lake house architecture. And then this chap as well, whose name I'm probably going to butcher. So apologies if he ever ends up watching this. I don't know if that's Pitine or Pyveen. Um, he he works for Microsoft um, and he's got a fantastic blog about implementing a lake house. So this is just an, an extract from that blog where he talks about uh, for the gold layer of your lake house, he recommends it a Kimball style star schema. So that kind of segues nicely into a little bit of an overview of lake house architecture. Uh, he referenced there the gold layer. So this is all about, uh, he's using their medallion architecture uh, terminology, the idea that we land the data into a bronze layer, uh, clean it and move it into a silver layer, and then we use a gold layer for surfacing that up for analytics purposes. In advancing analytics world, we use slightly different terminology. So rather than bronze, silver, gold, we try and use something a little bit more descriptive. So we have a, a raw layer for the raw data, 
a base layer where we've cleaned that raw data and we call it the curated layer where we do that analytics uh, piece. In terms of implementing the star schema, it's that gold layer or in AA terminology, the curated layer where that star schema model is going to live. Now, the purpose of today's session isn't really to go into depth about what a star schema is. Um, if you're here um, attending uh, an analytics conference about data modeling, um, it's kind of a an assumption that you'll understand uh, in basic terms of star schema. To keep a, a very brief description, it means your data model is going to have two types of table. Fact table, which um, is going to hold all the, the numbers that you're going to want to aggregate and do analysis about. And then dimension tables, which hold all of the attributes and descriptive um, information about that data that you're going to analyze. If it is a topic you want to go into in more depth, these are the two um, texts that you, you really need to check out. So Ralph Kimball and the Data Warehouse Toolkit, that um, text is now pushing 30 years old, so it's not particularly um, new theory. That's always been sort of the definitive guide for uh, star schema and dimensional modeling. And then a little bit more recent, uh, the complete reference star schema by Christopher Adamson. So uh, definitely recommend checking that out. Now, when it comes to designing that schema, I've already referenced there are two different uh, personas. Um, for people that are watching, um, I'm going to encourage you to use the React function in Teams. I presume that's still turned on, Richard. Um, I normally, in my talks, try and get a little bit interactive and, and throw a few questions out there. So in terms of these personas, we've got the developers who are very technical, can write the code, understand the tech. They get excited about things like Z ordering and uh, fusion engines and all that kind of thing. Uh, and then we've got the business users, the people uh, I said they were at the coal face, um, working with uh, the business, delivering those services, potentially the people that are going to do the analysis um, and, and need, need the data available to them to, to drive forward business decisions. So in terms of people who are watching, if you give me a thumbs up, if you would identify yourself as a developer, and we'll go for the heart reaction if you think you're more of a business user. Cool. So that from people that have responded there, we're, we're mostly developer audience, which is good. Um, so really, the content of this can be aimed at either of those two audiences, but it's predominantly the, the development team that sort of end up um, running with this. So when it comes to actually designing the star schema, I'm going to take you through um, our requirements gathering methodology. And that methodology is called Sunbeam. Now, Sunbeam is a methodology that uh, we've been working on at Advancing Analytics. Um, it's something that I've personally been working on for five or six years. And over that five or six year period, it's, it's certainly evolved. Um, for starters, it didn't used to have a name, literally, We've only dubbed it Sunbeam in the last couple of months. Um, we've trademarked the term Sunbeam, and we are going to commission a nice logo for it, but we haven't done that yet. So you've got Teletubbies as a placeholder. Um, so Sunbeam, um, methodology developed by Advancing Analytics. I've been working on it and contributing to it for five or six years now. That sounds really, really grandiose. That sounds like I should possibly rewrite my tagline on LinkedIn to say, Johnny Winter, creator of Sunbeam. Um, but the reality is this is very much based on existing methodologies that are already out there. And those existing data modeling tools and techniques are specifically Beam and Sun Modeling, which it's obviously, it's very obvious from that where the, the name Sunbeam comes from. So to give you an overview of what Beam is, Beam comes from uh, this book, Agile Data Warehouse Design by Lawrence Core. Um, as an aside, I actually have been invited to a meeting with Lawrence Core in a couple of weeks' time. I was like a proper fanboy about it. Um, I've had this book for like five or six years. Beam itself stands for uh, Business Event Analysis and Modeling. And hearing uh, designing a data warehouse described in those terms as business events was a bit of a um, a landmark moment for me. So going back to reading Kimball, and that's always talked about modeling a business process, Beam talks about it being modeling an event. So rather than 
trying to understand a process, it starts to talk about we collect a series of events, and when that event happens, we collect as much information about the event as we can, and then we can aggregate those events and perform our analysis about it. So just that mindset change in terms of going from a process to a set of events, I found really, really, really valuable. There are two specific parts of Beam that I that we're going to utilise for doing uh, the Sunbeam method methodology, and that's the three Ds and the seven Ws, which I'll describe in more detail further on in the presentation. So, the second part of this is Sun modelling. Uh, let's go for another React. Who's heard of Sun modelling? If you want to give me a thumbs up in the chat. That's potentially a nobody, which is absolutely fine because it's not particularly well heard of. Um, I describe it as a word of mouth technique. And what I mean by that is if you uh, if you search the internet for material about some modeling, it's very, very difficult to find anything. There is no textbook I can point you in the direction of. Um, it's just a technique that seems to have been passed around word of mouth between data professionals. Now, I've got some examples of some advocates of some modeling. I very first heard of it back in 2016 when I went to a talk at um, SQL Bits. That was done by a lady called Emma Zambonini. Uh, at the time, she was working for a consultancy called Coeo, um, and she gave a really, really great presentation on it. Um, I believe Emma has A, left Coeo, and B, um, she either got married or divorced, and I don't think that's even her name anymore. But the materials I had from attending that conference, it was a presentation done by Emma Zambonini at the time. Pete Moore, um, he is a or used to be an independent data consultant based around Manchester. So I'm I'm up in Preston in Lancashire. Um, he used to sort of knock around the the Manchester data scene. Um, I was working in a data team for a company called Travel Councils at the time, and uh, Pete knew our boss, and he came in and gave us a, a bit of a workshop about sun modeling as a technique. So it was kind of a chance for me to go into it in a bit more depth. Terry McCann. So Terry McCann, um, I've already mentioned Simon Whiteley. Terry McCann was the other founder of Advancing Analytics and our other director. One of the few hits you'll get on the internet is if you go on YouTube and search for some modeling. He did a lightning talk at one of the data relay events. Um, so he's got a, a lightning talk about it there as well. Those three people have got one thing in common, which is this chap. Um, Mark Whithorn is the professor of analytics at the University of Dundee. By all accounts, he's credited with created some, uh, creating some modeling, and it's something that he teaches to his students. To go into some modeling in a little bit more depth, it asks you to think about uh, data modeling in three, these three concepts. And I want to stress that this is data modeling for analytics workloads and analytics purposes. So we're not talking about um, doing database design for OLTP systems. We're talking specific to analytics, three types of data model. And that's the user model, the physical model, and the logical model. Now, the user model is how your users interact with that data. It's normally represented in uh, graphs, charts, and grids. And from a requirements gathering perspective, this can be a good starting point. This can be um, a good place for your users to come along. We want to implement a, a brand new data platform. What are your analytics needs? Right, well, here are some examples of some reports that we already use. If I look at these examples and having my data modeling star schema hat on, I can look and see that, right, well, sales revenue by product category description means that I'm going to want a fact table that's got sales revenue in it. I'm going to want to have a dimension table that's got product category information in that as well. I can look at the line chart and say, OK, well, my sales fact table is probably going to want unit quantity in there as well. And I'm going to need some kind of uh, date dimension so that I can trend that over time. And then I look at the grid. And there's a few more examples of dimensional attributes that I'm probably going to want to include. Now, the thing with user models is they tend to have a very narrow scope. They tend to be for very, very specific, um, serve a very, very specific purpose. And ultimately, if you're building a data platform, you want a more holistic view. You don't want to be able to answer these specific questions. We want to be able to um, unlock the ability to um, answer more questions and have a more holistic view of a business. So 
User models can be a good starting point, but they're not going to go into enough detail. They're not going to have a wide enough scope for you to be able to design your star schema effectively. Almost the opposite end of that scale is the physical model. This goes into potentially too much detail. So an example of a physical model is almost a, um, a database uh, ERD diagram. This has got all sorts of things in it. So we've got uh, data types defined, primary and foreign keys defined. Um, we've got crow's foot notation so we can see uh, our cardinality and things like that. As a developer with my technical hat on, if I needed to implement a data platform and somebody just gave me an ERD diagram saying, yep, this is what we need, that'd be fantastic. But it's just not realistic. Business users that are going to use the platform just don't think about the data in this way. Um, you can't just rock up to a new engagement, whether you're internal and going to internal stakeholders or you're in a consultancy setting and going out to clients. And when you come to do the requirements gathering, you can't just say, yeah, just give me the ERD that you want us to implement. It's, it's just not going to work. So we need something that's going to have that Goldilocks effect. So it's going to be just right. It's going to uh, explain the data in a way that is accessible for our business users so they understand what's going to be implemented but something that our development team can take away and implement um, with their technical hat on in terms of doing that implementation. So that um, halfway point is the logical model. This is designed to effectively show the data in business terms and how it's all uh, related. Um, and the method that we use for creating a logical model is to do some modeling. Now, when it comes to doing the Sunbeam process, the way we actually facilitate it is to either hold a workshop or, depending on the scope of the project, hold a series of workshops. And you need to make some decisions about how that, uh, the format of that, how you're going to do it. So in the before times, when I first started running these workshops, it would always be in person, get all the people in a room, gather around a whiteboard, and we'll draw out some logical models um, doing a whiteboard in session. Obviously, the world has changed um, and it's a lot more about remote work and doing remote meetings. So a couple of suggestions on there are some apps that you can use as online collaborative whiteboards. We've had some really good success recently using Miro to facilitate these workshops. Mural is another good option. Um, if you work in an organization that isn't so keen on using third parties, maybe if you're a Microsoft house, Microsoft does have a whiteboard, whiteboarding product. The Microsoft whiteboard, in all honesty, is a little bit rubbish, but ultimately um, it's potentially an option for you. I've also even seen it done with just um, sharing a screen on PowerPoint, um, which it's a little bit less collaborative, but it can it displays well. And I've even um, seen someone attempt doing it with Visio too. So make a decision, are you gonna do this in person or online? And if you're gonna do it online, what tool are you gonna utilize? Who should you invite? This is all about collaboration between your technical users, um, your IT team, and your business users, uh, getting them involved in that process, bringing them on that journey for that um, data platform or lakehouse implementation. You need to uh, make sure that the people you come along have got good domain knowledge um, so they understand the process that you're going to do. I'd definitely recommend having at least two people running the workshop, and they normally come from the the technical side of the fence. Um, it's good to have a facilitator, somebody that's going to run the uh, run the workshop, drive the conversations, um, ask the questions, potentially stop people going off on tangents. You know, especially if you're time bound as well, and, and making sure that you um, kind of stick to your agenda. Look to choose one business process. So using this methodology is not about designing an entire enterprise data warehouse. Um, it's more about choosing a narrow scope, focusing on a particular business process and business area. And then once you've built that out and delivered that first iteration of your lake house, build on that at a future date. And yeah, as I was mentioning, um, you need people with decent domain knowledge of whichever business process it is you've identified. Um, but you don't want too many people. So one of the kind of almost, I guess, barriers that sometimes I've come up with this is that People have got day jobs to do, and they don't necessarily want to take time out to spend an afternoon doing a data modeling workshop. So 
from that perspective, it's impractical to invite too many people because the business still needs to run. Um, you've also got the classic uh, problem of too many cooks spoiling the broth if too many people get involved. So three to five people with the main knowledge of the business process is um, a really good uh, starting place. So into the methodology itself, and I talked about the three Ds. The three Ds pretty much describes almost the agenda and the structure of the way these workshops are going to run. So the three Ds are discover an event, where we ask the question, who does what? Describe an event, where we use the seven Ws, which I'll monitor on a later slide, and then document event. Documenting an event is where we use the sum model in. So three Ds is the beam concept, which I covered in one of the earlier slides. This is the uh, structure we're going to follow. When it comes to documentation, Beam itself. So if anybody is already familiar with Beam and has potentially owns the owns the book, Beam itself comes with its own set of associated documentation. Um, my experience with that documentation, it's very very thorough. It's very very vast. If you work in a large team and you've got a dedicated business analyst who's responsible for the requirements, um, engineering, gathering requirements, managing those requirements. Potentially, Beam is, and the Beam documentation might be something that you want to explore. My personal experience is that a lot of the time um, for data and analytics teams, you end up double hatting. It's quite often the development team that are also going to be responsible for managing the requirements as well. And so the reason I have gone down the route of using some modeling for my documentation, it's a little bit more lightweight, a little bit easier, a little bit um, quicker to implement um, and, and a bit more of a lightweight approach, which hopefully helps you get to your results a little bit quicker. So I guess swapping up that documentation wasn't intended to be a, a critique of Beam, but it was more almost providing an alternative that can get you to your results quicker. So to run through that agenda, first we want to discover the event, and we discover the event by asking who does what. So for the sake of demonstration today, I'm going to step through a retail sales example. Um, if we said, right, the business process we're going to look at is who does what. Um, sorry, business process is retail sales. Who does what? The answer to that question in retail sales could be who does what? A customer buys a product. So we define an event there. Customer buys product is the event. The events will always have an actor and an action. So that's the format that you're looking to um, have those have those events discovered in. When I first started doing this, we'd always discover an event and then move on to describing it and then documenting it. One of the things that's evolved over time is actually sometimes it can work quite effectively once you've identified your business process, identify all of your events in that process before you move on to describing and documenting them. So again, for the sake of a simple uh, example, I'm going to do retail sales and customer buys products pretty much covers that process. If you can imagine it was a business that does um, online retail of bespoke products, you might have an, uh, the first event might be that customer places order. Uh, then you might have a manufacturer fulfills order. Then you might have courier delivers order. So their sales process might actually have three events in it. Again, I'm just going to cover one event today. So who does what? customer buys product. Once we've defined our event, we're going to describe it. Again, talking about the evolution of Sunbeam, and I have to forgive the pretentiousness of this slide. I used to uh, study English literature. When I started with this process, I used uh, Rudyard Kipling's Six Honest Serving Men for the process. So um, Six Honest Serving Men, what, why, when, how, where, and who. Beam actually goes beyond the six serving men, and I've got seven. So who, what, when, where, why, how, and how many. And you please have to forgive the slight tenuousness of how and how many being Ws. They contain a W as opposed to starting with a W. So taking our event, customer buys product, we're going to ask that question about that event, or those set of questions about that event. And as we ask those questions, we're going to document it as we go. Using a sum model, so I've got here a sum modeling template. I've included in there what my event is as an aid memoir, something to refer back to. I've got myself a list of the seven W's down the side as well. I changed up the order. I've stuck how many to the top, and the reason for that being is I'm going to start with the how many. So first things first, we draw a circle 
in the middle of the model. It doesn't have to be yellow. I just I'm a bit basic because the sun is yellow. Um, first question: Customer buys product. What's the how many of customer buys product? So it can be how many or it can be how much. And the examples I'm going to show when it comes to customer buying products, we want to know well how much revenue came from the transaction. Um, how much did it cost us? What was the profit? How much profit did we make? What was the margin? We can calculate that from the, um, the revenue and cost and the um, figures from there. How many products did they buy? How many orders did they place? Look to ask your business users in the workshop for as many how many is related specifically to that product, uh, relating specifically to that event as you can. It doesn't have to be exhaustive straight away. I tend to find that a healthy half dozen is a good starting point to get a conversation going. You can always add to them later down the line. Um, so if not, sometimes business users get concerned they've not identified everything. I tend to sort of say to them, it's okay, this is a great start for 10 and we can always at a later date iterate on this. Once you've done the how many, you ask who. Now, there's a big clue here because we've already asked the question, who does what? And the answer was customer buys product. So our who is going to be customer. So on the sum model, we create a spoke coming out from our sum with the how many's in it. And we label that as customer. The dot represents the cardinality. So uh, we're saying there that for each transaction or each uh, revenue event, there's going to be one customer. Once you've identified that object, don't just stop there. Now turn to your um, stakeholders and business users in the workshop and ask them what is it you'd like to know about your customer so they might say well i'd like to know our customer's name might like to know their date of birth so we can do some analytics around age might like to know their gender we might want to know some other demographic information keep on asking what else would you like to know what else would you like to know what else would you like to know and so you really have exhausted all the possible things about a customer that the stakeholders might want to um, want to know about. Again, for the sake of demonstration, I've kept this really, really brief and only included a handful of uh, attributes. When in the real world, the customer object is something that normally has quite a lot of attributes coming off it. Once we've asked the who, we can ask the what. And again, the clue is in the event because we've already asked who does what and we've answered customer buys product. So our what is going to be product. So we add product to the diagram. Again, for every uh, revenue event there's going to be one product then we ask the stakeholders what would you like to know about your product so they might want to know the product code and the product name and the description and the category and the color so at this point they're starting to get a feel for how they can do their um their analysis so they can look at how many um, how many units of red products did we sell how many units of green products do we sell once we've done the what, we can move on to the when. Pretty much every Sun model ever will have some kind of uh, date dimension in it because pretty much all analytics end up trending over time. But date's a little bit more interesting because we model this slightly differently. So somebody may want to see daily sales, in which case they could have got uh, revenue by date. But they're probably going to want to roll that up. So on that example user model that I showed, it was trending it by month. Or you might want to roll months up into quarters, or maybe you want to do an analysis over several years. In terms of representing that on the sum model, as opposed to spokes that fan out from the objects we've identified, these are represented in a straight line. And the straight line is representing hierarchy. So we're showing that for this date object, we can actually roll it up by months, by quarters, and by years. On any given object you identify, you can have more than one hierarchy. So imagine you're working with a, uh, a financial calendar that's got a four, four, five um, weeks pattern in it. So you can't roll weeks up into months because it doesn't, the cardinality doesn't fit. Um, so we've got an alternative hierarchy where we're rolling up weeks into financial periods and then financial years. So you can have more than one hierarchy. Once you've done the when, move on to the where. So again, from a retail analytics perspective, where are the stores? Which stores are selling? Um, which products um, are doing well? 
And again, we can mix and match at this point. So you can have hierarchies and you can have uh, spokes for your attributes. Location is another fantastic example of a hierarchy. So you might want to roll up by uh, town or city and then by county or state and then potentially country or region if it's a global business as well. Once you've done the where, we can move on to the why. Why can be a little bit abstract. So again, for a retail sales example, I'm saying, why did my customer buy the product? They bought it because it was on promotion. So I'm going to capture some information about uh, any promotions that may have been applied. Um, so I've got promo code, promo description, and the how. Again, how can also be a little bit abstract. How did my customer buy the product? So I'm going to say that, well, how do they pay for it? So whether they're cash card finance, um, or card and finance, who is the payment provider? Now that is a finished sum model. From a business user's perspective, this has all been done using business language. We've not gotten into any technical terms. We've described the language in their vocabulary and how they understand it and how they see the interaction between those various objects. Somebody once described a sum model to me as being like a mind map for your data, which I thought was a really, really nice description. From a technical perspective, what we've got here is a straw man star schema. This is a very basic high level blueprint for a schema that you could go away and implement. So hopefully we've, we've, we're meeting both purposes here. We've got something that business users can be comfortable with. We've got something that the development team can go away and look to try and implement. Some extra advice on doing the sum modeling. You need to ask the seven W's multiple times because because often there's more than one answer. Again, for the sake of demonstration and to try and keep it brief, when I asked who and we said customer, once we describe that customer, instead of moving on to the what straight away, we should really ask who else. Um, again, retail sales on an example, another who that might be involved in that event is who is the salesperson. So you'd then draw another spoke on your model and then have a salesperson object and then find out what else you want to describe. Where is another good example where you could have multiple wares because you might have the where is it bought, where is it going to be delivered to, that kind of thing. For some W's, there might not be an answer. So um, I already referenced it, but how and why are quite abstract. And I've sat in workshops before and said, why does the customer buy the products? And it, you know, it isn't necessarily easy to think of an answer. And that's fine. The seven W's are kind of there to get the conversation going and try and prompt people to think about these things. If you ask a 7W and nobody can think of an answer, that's cool, move on. Make sure you use one sum model per event. So if your business process does have multiple events in it, don't try and jam those all into one um, sum model. So that example that I talked about, whereby potentially it was bespoke orders. So customer places order, manufacturer fulfills order, uh, courier delivers order. Do that as three separate sum models. Don't try and uh, mash it all into one, which means that potentially you might want to hold multiple workshops because you might want different audiences in to give different domain knowledge for different pro, uh, different events within that process. You can do this before data discovery. My, my preference is to do it before data discovery, to be honest. Um, when I talk about data discovery, I mean the part in the project where you go in and actually start looking at the customer's data, how they store things and where things are stored. I find if you do that before the modeling, um, the modeling workshops, you've already got preconceptions about how you think the star scheme is going to be built. So I personally prefer to have no preconceptions, um, get the business's view on how things should fit together, and then go back and almost do a mapping exercise after the event to figure out where all these objects are, where they're stored, and how we're going to be able to consume them into our data platform. Part of that is this concept of not getting too bogged down in terms of the uh, in terms of what you already know about your data so um i guess let's think of an example of this um if we were running the workshop and we were describing the customer and somebody said oh, i'd like to know my customer's eye color so i can do a analysis of whether people with blue eyes or brown eyes buy more fridge freezers now the data professionals in the room probably know that the sales system doesn't contain an eye color attribute record it in the sum model anyway what's a really good exercise to do is uh, do all of this modeling and afterwards do a gap analysis because what you can do then is you can inform uh, the teams responsible for business systems development 
of, of any gaps and so you can potentially create features that can go into future releases of, of things like um, those uh, those business systems. Um, you also have to then bear in mind that obviously you're probably not going to implement it for the data platform, but it's just a great way to, to capture any any gaps that uh, might be in the core systems for analytical needs. You can use that straw man logical model to potentially go away and design a physical model. Um, my early years of doing this, we used to just give this some model to the technical team and the developers, and they were more than happy to go away and build the platform off the back of that. In a consultancy setting, we've had clients and customers who want a little bit more reassurance about exactly what's going to be implemented. So what we've actually done is we've taken that some model and then uh, converted it into an ERD to say, right, this is what we're going to try and build. But you've also got to bear in mind that that is almost a target schema, a target design. Uh, and that it may well change. Um, it can change for lots and lots of different reasons. So referencing that idea of not getting bogged down, some of the objects that get identified through some modeling, they just might not exist in the source system, so you can't then uh, bring them through. Another thing is potentially when you come to implementation, you find it becomes sensible to consolidate some of those objects. So I've had, I've had recent examples of that where we, through the modeling processes with the business, we identified two um, separate concepts and then when we came to the implementation actually they were sat in the same tables in the source system and they were one-to-one -one. and so we just um denormalized that further and consolidated it into a single object because it, it made sense so it's it's the target implementation not necessarily the fixed design as it were um if you do do some multiples and models you can consolidate that into a bus matrix which is a, another kimball artifact and that just then gives you uh, the opportunity to see the commonality across those events um, in terms of the objects you've identified for your dimensions. A bus matrix can be quite a good tool to help drive priorities because you can see um, you know, potentially which events uh, have got the fewest dimensions that you can implement those first or which dimensions have got the most commonality so you might want to uh, focus on delivering those first as well. Now I've waxed lyrical about my super duper methodology that I've helped design I don't want to try and claim it's perfect. So there's definitely some gaps in here. Um, it assumes one to one, uh, sorry, one to many relationships everywhere. So if you're in a situation where you've got a, a many to many relationship, um, this process doesn't really cover that. Um, so, you know, that um, logical model didn't have the concept of, say, a bridge table in there. And then the other thing is it doesn't cover dimension type. So we've identified customer as an object that we're going to create a dimension for, but doesn't answer the question to say, right, does that need to be tracked over time? Is it going to be a um, like a type one dimension where we only ever uh, keep the current record? Does it need to be type two where it's going to have multiple records for a customer that change over time when attributes like name or address might potentially change? Now, even though I've identified those gaps, I've not yet fallen ill by those gaps being there. What I've tend to find is throughout implementation and through continuing to have conversations with business users, those kind of things have, have always kind of come out in the wash and you know gone into the implementation. So it ha hasn't caused me any trouble so far, but I think it's worthwhile bearing those things in mind to make sure you continue to have those conversations. And as I said, this methodology is still evolving. So potentially we'll look to uh, bring something in that covers those at a later date. My last point, Make this your own. So here's me waxing lyrical about this fantastic methodology that um, I've helped to develop and uh, advancing analytics and now sort of promoting as a, as a star schema uh, modeling technique. This came out of me um, learning about other techniques and then uh, getting rid of the bits I didn't like, bringing in different elements to it and evolving it over time. If you found today useful and you'd like to go away and try and run this methodology exactly as I've described it. Great, I'm glad to have shared it with you and I hope it brings you some success. Flip side of that though, if you want to um, critique this, change it up, if there are bits that you just think, no, nah, that's not really gonna work for me, bin them off, get rid of them, it's fine. Um, and again, if you wanna supplement this with extra stuff as well, make this your own, turn this into your own methodology, You know, by all means, you don't have to do an exact replica of Sunbeam. That is everything from me. That's right on time. So I don't know if I've got any sort of time to take questions live. By all means, we can stick things in the chat.